First exercise, the uh, Holden Poke. Three pokes, then one poke. Important is to always keep the palm ridge with the knuckles apparent, not break, and play the thumb not horizontal but side diagonal so that it plays close to the vertical fingers, two, three, four, five, and not lying down, triggered by the arm but rather by the knuckle of itself from the uh, articulation of the thumb on the hand so that you can push down but don't break the support of the palm muscularly strengthen under and articulate and drop the fingers while lifting or not the wrist, but maintaining the arm and the wrist completely flexible and the finger straight and triggered by the knuckle to the tip. It can be rounded obviously when you need to play something light and fast or possibly something slow and extremely emotionally intense or stretched. The overlegato obviously implements the overholding of the preceding note on the next one so you can sing or imitate singing therefore by this real legato, finger legato. But you have to regulate therefore when in your muscular memory you will embed the articulation of lifting the finger that played so that it doesn't overstay, especially between 4 and 5 which share a tendon and they're normally they're not independent like 1 and 2 since the hand is made for a million of years to uh, grab and hold between 1 and 2, not 4 and 5 so, uh, to equalize the articulation, the independence, the strength, the um, articulation from the finger, from the hand, not from the arm. Therefore, the uh, Holden poke measures in your um, subconscious, little by little, when to lift the note you just played. Then you can do the rhythmic exercise to test the quality of the articulation. Crisp air legato, I call it air legato, but can be called crisp legato, is when the notes connect, but just on the moment of lifting the preceding. If you do it too early, obviously it's staccato, that's air legato, that could be detached, staccato, especially if you scratch the fingers and they don't stay, but the minimum amount of time on the keys. Especially if you can play them on the edge, because that's when they respond the quickest, given the action of the instrument. So it's a topography to organize the terrain according to the different chords or tonalities in which the pieces are written. So the position Chopin used to teach is the whole tone. It allows for the longer fingers to be on the upper position black keys and the short two fingers at the two ends, thumb and five, on the low white keys so that naturally it creates a visible
noticeable ridge on the palm for the knuckles to be there and, and to trigger the practicing of lifting while holding and then playing the next. For instance, in thirds, supporting it under rather than stiffening the wrist or the arm to hold it. You can also do holding in thirds with alternative thirds not poked together like this but so you can practice independence of voicing through the fingers as well as the articulation independence. Staccato or legato by two or all legato. Naturally, you can and should uh, play this on any five sounds that correspond to the tonality in which you play. It could be in C major, with all white keys, or a key with a lot of black keys. To explore the different configurations of the topography of the keyboard's terrain and always try to find the ultimate position that allows you to control your touch from pianissimo to forte always dropping the fingers quickly on the bottom even in the softer dynamics don't push slower when you play softer or of course you'll push faster when you play loud because that's the essence of the, the way but if you can do it also fast and deep but not loud because you don't use the arm energy to push down the key through the finger from the arm but just from the uh, ridge of the palm progressively you'll be able to play louder just from the palm and not using the thrust of the arm but um, the exercises combine articulation independence as well as dynamic ranges more than technique it's about touch control in different uh, options um, here thematized and sometimes schematized um, let's give an example of a exercise for finger, in finger independence thumb and second finger playing eighth notes in both hands or in one hand alone and then add a group of sixteenth notes to practice the independence within the same hand You can do the same with thirds or with seconds. You can also do it to separate hands Here it's demonstrated with two against three with the triplets instead of sixteenth notes. Uh, polyrhythmia, poly um, fingeria, <laughs> and also articulation of the thumb, flexibility being displaced from the C to the D, this kind of exercises can be annoying 
annoying because they're like tongue twisters for fingers. In thirds with two against three. And if in the process of practicing them you feel tension in the tendons, then take five minutes off before you try the next exercise. But don't stay long time on the same exercise because that's exactly where you tense the tendons to obtain the articulation independence control of the fingers in many dynamic ranges, but then it remains tense, so it has to replenish its uh, lubricant liquid that the body produces through the glands to never hurt, but still exercise its endurance. It's more about practicing um, marathon than sprints, if I may take this um, analogy with running. In this example is um, the exercise for the scales. The example of C major is more obvious visually because it doesn't have black keys. So you can see the thumb has to flexibly um, enter under the palm, but not at the entrance position where you squeeze the first phalange. You rather want to bend from the tip of the thumb's um, knuckle and enter further in under the hand, which allows you then here to bypass two fingers or here three of the vertical fingers. And of course avoid to do this to reach it by developing more flexibility just like when you do text messaging of the thumb so that the thumb becomes a partner of the vertical three other four other fingers not trying to play it straight because that would bring the wrist too high and then the reach will be weaker by being under of the knuckles for the palm support but always have a higher palm support in order to have the thumb play not flat when you want it to be in, in cases of quick uh, notes or scales or patterns in order to be equal to the other fingers and not be playing with the weight of the arm when the others play only with the tip of the fingers vertically. So the scale is practiced in C major by playing the fingers who are not thumb together in clusters. The 2-3, two, 2-3-4. Three, two, three, and the thumb passes under without to turn the wrist, which helps the articulation of the thumb. Particularly so if you want to use it in the whole tone scale, just like in the earlier exercises in Chopin's disposition of fingers on the keyboard. And you can do it staccato, or you can do it also two against three. against three it's a bit unnecessary complications in terms of independence of rhythm when you want to acquire independence of fingers so I guess it's too much of a sandwich to swallow at once it could be better I assume to just hold the group of non-thumb and then play the thumb I think that helps to um, focus already on the flexibility of the thumb before you do other exercises of independence rhythmically speaking. And try to always hold the palm without moving or the wrist without playing up and down like a gondola. In other words, anything you can do to control passage under the for the thumb under the palm and the others uh, straight when I say straight fingers I don't mean tense fingers to a certain extent they are knuckle to tip but they are not pressured you don't needing to squeeze the tendon from the um, all the way in the arm to hold stiffly the fingers, but by strengthening and holding poke practicing little by little 
the ridge that supports um, the palm and then the palm delegates most of the articulation to the fingers and the wrist and the arm remain in flotation or to say like a suspension in a car um, to um, control the weight. It's important to lift the fingers and keep the wrist in position. Avoid moving the wrist to play the fingers. Then you can practice it in consecutive fingers, holding one, two, and poking three and four, holding two and three, and poking four, five. Then you can hold the third finger, move the eighth notes legato, or perhaps non legato. But then add the fifth finger on both hands. It's like mirrored two hands fingers. I combine in this exercise this um, independence of fingers with articulation of fingers and flexibility of thumb while straight performance of thumb not but two, three, four, and five to match the thumb in a diagonal position. of independence can be done but by layers in order to understand and implement. You hold the third finger as a pivot that never moves. You play legato 2-4 in eighth notes, doesn't have to be loud, and sixteenth notes for one and five, when two and four remains legato. One and five can be legato or a legato. in the left hand, the eighth notes, two, four, and one, five for the sixteenth notes. As usual, I like to add for a later excitement, once this is achieved, in terms of independence of fingers in polyrhythmic independence to do the two against three in the same system instead of sixteenth in triplets. So again, hold, eighth notes, legato two four, and one five will be in triplets. When originally in the earlier moment it was with two against one, sixteenth on eighth notes. For the practicing of the two against three specifically rhythmically now, uh, the scale of C major, or any scale you want to practice, but the example in C major would be triplets in the right hand going up, eighth notes by two in the left hand going up, and the of course opposite on the way down in order to return to where we started. And then... is the two against three in both directions, right hand or left hand. What is important to stress in the two against three is to avoid playing the two between two and three. Which almost comes to be a syncopation. Ta 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 ti ta. In fact, the insertion of the second compared to the three of the two it's exactly right away after the second of the three. I know it's confusing when I say it, but I give you a contrasting example. What not to do, what to do, so you play brushing on the second of the three, the second of the two brushes against the second of the three. It's a good thing to um, to have in mind because very often when we play two against three or three against four, we tend to play it in between 
in the center, in the middle between the other two or the other the three, but it has to be earlier in order to create a quality, equality between the two. Um, then there's a practicing of the ring of tetra chords, being the four sounds in Greek tetra means four, for the scale. And I suggest this in major because the two tetra chords are similarly constructed ton, ton, semitone. Therefore, when you add another one on top of the preceding top, you're in G major because of the ton, semitone, ton, ton, semitone construction of the tetra chord, you have to add F sharp to be the leading tone to G. If the top of G tetra chord becomes the bottom of D major, then the bottom of G major, which became the top in D major, for the top of D major, which is becoming the bottom for A major, and then E major, and every time you add um, a leading tone. And then you add, therefore, a sharp going up the circle of fifth, C, G, D, A, E, A, E sharp. And so if you play them in 2, four, th two 3, 4, 1, or 4, 3, 2, 1, to be right in the order. That was not right. 4, 3, 2, 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can start even lower in the keyboard and think C major by the combination of the two tetra chords in the two hands combined. Then the top tetra chord in the right hand becomes the bottom of G major. And you add A major, E major. It makes you play in every tonality by half of a scale given the scale has seven tones from the circle of fifths dropped into or stressed into a, a step motion. So if you practice C major, you become G major, which becomes D major, which becomes A major, which becomes E major, which becomes B major, which becomes F sharp major. I cannot say it fast enough compared to playing it. It doesn't have to be played. Could, but shouldn't be always played fast, but it's fun. Fun in the sense of the fact that when you practice, you realize that um, you can play different dispositions very quickly according to the combination of black and white keys, as you would do when you play a piece in a given tonality or modulating in given tonality, so that you can have articulation um, independence also with every combination there is 12 tonalities. <laughs> on the coordination of the two hands uh, to collaborate to create an equal con fluid connectivity. You can do it on the way down with flats or on the way up with sharps. The ring of tetra chords is also um, giving room for uh, practicing the scales themselves as traditionally saw with the passage of the thumb which we saw earlier in the exercise for flexibility of the thumb articulation to, to reach equal articulation of the tips of the fingers regardless of their position length or disposition of the hands um, construction. So of course ma major, minor ascending, half major up, minor down, with a third. On the way down, major if you look at ton, ton, semitone in reverse. And of course, bottom minor, ton, semitone, ton. So we have ascending minor, descending minor. And then harmonic minor with the augmented second between the flat six, which is the minor for the sixth, and the leading tone, which is next to the tonic in semitone, so it creates a gap. Harmonic. Major, ascending, descending, harmonic, which is up and down for practicing. It doesn't have to be ascending or descending. So in C major, it would be. So you can do it like this way chromatically and ascend to play in each tone each semitone, on each semitone rather, 
a full scale. Um, you can do it on several octaves. It doesn't have to be so restricted to just one. You can do it in mirrors. And then, now, if you do it in mirror, you could do the ascending, descending at the same time. That's funny. And then, if you like, but you don't have to. You can do the harmonic both ways the same in totally mirrored. Or even do it um, on several octaves but parallel. Uh, so, in major. Even higher, and of course, then on the way down, you can do back. Actually, you can do also minor on the way down, going up and down. You can combine them as you like. In fact, it's better to not always do the same because it's less repetitively boring. It's almost like practicing um, mental um, also concentration rather than just mechanical separation of the thought and the. Uh, action. Uh, I think it's important to maintain that um, combination between thought, understanding in real time of what you do and control it, rather than practice just the fingers moving and you watch them do. It doesn't help in performance. It's always good to be ahead mentally of what you will do. And um, because it's repetitive, uh, like minimalist music, you have to be very acutely attentive to be always ahead of what you do in order to do it correctly in terms of disposition, for instance. Now the arpeggios, I like to practice them and suggest to have them practiced in canon, for instance, dominant seven in the left hand. So in canon. that you play in the written pieces, not in the exercises, is not always matching the two hands at the same time, doing the same thing each finger in each hand does. You could do it in a, a mirror position. Or in parallel. Now, regarding the preparation of strengthening and stretching the fingers, that's the most important not to overdo because that can hurt the hand in the process of acquiring that independence. So that's why it's important to monitor the tension of the tendon constantly, preventively. That's, I think, very important for every teacher to avoid students get um, tendinitis, which is the ultimate uh, black sheep word not to use for pianist because you don't want to have that and uh, you want to uh, enhance all the independence flexibility strengthening through the palm of the fingers but not on the expense of the tension in the arm or the wrist in which case the exercise is meaningless because it only hurts more here is to separate the tension builder for the palm support fingers articulation from the wrist arm uh, flexibility and not have it all one wooden arm intention. So the exercise for that is to play um, the arpeggios in four notes like the dominant seventh in this case. One, three, two, four, three, five, two, four. First inversion, second inversion, third inversion. practice hold and poke you also 
also could practice it in rhythms holding the pivotal finger the longest one in the two hands the third and then playing one two four five around with inversions on a single same bass note not to confuse with fundamental root note of the chord first inversion second inversion of the fifth third inversion of the seventh most people practice the scales with inversions on the same notes such as just literally inverting the direction with a root position first inversion six five second inversion four plus and then this for the uh, third inversion with the always um, triton at the different placement here is two four here is one three for the fingering this is two four and what can be done too prefer to keep it on the same uh, bass note, in this case C, but can be done, of course, uh, on each step, or semi-step. It could be also done uh, octaves apart. Crossed hands, that's a bit tricky. Like um, crossword puzzle for fingers and uh, mental twist um, exercise, which helps to be more independent of what you demand of your fingers. So ultimately, through this exercise, one day you can play trills with fingers, which normally have only one tendon and are less naturally independent than one tone. So an arpeggio exercise leads to thirds, um, which leads also to trills, it leads to articulation. In a way, it leads to everything, because you work through the arpeggio on um, how to uh, control your hands on the keyboard, regardless of the disposition in terms of stretch of thirds or seconds. And um, in order to be a variety for every day's practicing, I suggest to do it with different sevenths, not just the dominant, but the major seventh. Whoops, that was a mistake, sorry. I should practice my exercises more often myself. say they are my exercises a bit pushing because obviously everybody plays uh, arpeggios, it's a shared uh, knowledge, it's just that the way I dispose them and the way I organize them in the practicing that could be a little bit more customized there for mine, but there are so many ways to do more, it's just theme and endless variations. As long as you keep the uh, hand from remaining in the in the wrist, uh, you can touch it to feel the tendon not staying tense. As long as you stop for a few minutes, you just let your hands down. You don't have to shake them or anything to rest between exercises. Then the lubricant replenishes inside your arm naturally from your glands, and then you can go on again, meaning. But this why I suggest to do it with dominant sevens, with major sevens. That's more stretched because the inversions demand for more major thirds and mi uh, minor seconds. If you do it in the schematized um, two by two notes. Pog version or oh, the pivotal version hold only the third note finger sorry and then the arpeggios are the ultimate complexity 
you can do it also with minor sevenths or a diminished uh, fifth uh, seventh or half diminished sevenths. And when you practice um, any type of exercise, you wish you wish to always um, achieve something uh, short term. Independence, or uh, or um, articulation. That leads me to the octaves. The imprint of one five, lifting thumb and five from the articulation of the knuckles, not from the arm, not from the hand. Looks like lobsters almost. And then. Um, once you've played staccato the octave, instead of lifting right away the finger or rebouncing it like a ping pong ball to play the next in the momentum, momentum of the first, you can do also a little bit of scratch as if you squeeze the seventh, well, the octave into the seventh, B and C and D, but on the edge of the key, as if, as if you try to scratch or close. And then combine that with slight lift of the wrist and not the arm. Then you can do a little bit of wrist. The precision of the imprint being in the tip of the fingers locking on the octave by brushing on the edge of the keys which you don't play. In black keys is less obvious because obviously they are spaced and the white keys topographically are low. But if you practice around white keys you can do that. If you use only the wrist, you might be in for not precise octaves imprint. And if you only use the hand, meaning the fingers triggered by the hand and not the arm, then it's not enough powerful if you need to do... or fast, slow, loud... Most romantic piano music has octaves in order to um, give that symphonic impression that you grab the most notes at the same time, stretched wise and unison if it's well tuned. And not. And when you lift the wrist to be flexible in the articulation, in the air you could lose the imprint and land on the seventh instead of. So you can practice it by groups. And use the momentum of the lifting from the first into the second. It's like a perpetual motion. With the tips that are always precise and almost scratchy. Not always, they have to be scratching all the time, but it helps to maintain the precision of the articulation. So, of course, once you want to play them loud, and many sections in romantic music are where the octaves are sort of bombastic on the piano, then you have to add the arm energy and push. So you have to have more support in the palm not to break, to hold the imprint not to be unprecise, and then to have enough energy to lift the wrist to prepare the next octave if there are several in a row. And if they are loud, you use arm, wrist, palm, and support of the finger, and ultimately the tips have to be precise. But without the wrist you get stiff, without the palm you're unprecise for the tips of the fingers, and without the arm energy pushing you don't play loud, so you have to play a combination of all of this in order to play precise, loud and powerful and fast. And not by trying to play from the arm. Because that can last only for two or three of the octaves. And if there are more than that, then you get stiff. And when you get stiff, you don't have the right shifting. You go slightly short instead of... Or so you have to have the flexibility of the wrist the energy of the arm and the precision support of the palm and the tips of the fingers um, minimal if necessary with pedal holding 
uh, contact with the keys like you go to pick it up exactly where you want it it's like pick a cherry that gives you a sense of control of your octaves from being tense in the arm to being precise in the tip of the fingers you can practice them hold and poke also uh, with the thumb holding and practicing the individual articulation from the knuckle in the fifth finger or fourth mostly fourth for black keys and then fifth finger for white keys and same the opposite holding the fifth finger or the outer finger fifth or fourth and practicing the flexible articulation of the thumb of three with all lifting everybody has different ways to reach the same point the point is to find the way that satisfies the um, physiology of the hand and that you know how not to hurt yourself while acquiring the independence and power in the hands through the fingers in order to avoid shoulders uh, tension to avoid arms tension and to um, organize the system of your uh, morphology um, which whatever hand shape length of fingers you have um, has to work with the uh, topography of the terrain of the composer's desire to combine keys between the white and the black the way they're disposed up and lower and find um, with the advice obviously of the teacher the best fingering that corresponds to the different demands of the composer's edition if it's legato, if it's uh, sliding fingers uh, or practicing articulation of the same finger to play legato when other fingers are in, in polyphonic uh, fugue like playing occupied have to have more of that or capacity of playing a lot of articulation through a substitution you can do or it's tricky not to repeat so that you can get used to holding the thumb samples of exercises out of plethora of them that exist by many uh, or for many and these are a few of them I presented for you from what I suggest students of mine practice for their daily routine or around also a given technical complexity in a piece to achieve like for instance in a Beethoven sonata <laughs> to have independence between two trills and exchanges of fingers that have to stretch and all that lasting long enough not to trigger the tension in the arm because then it will hurt and you'll stop hence the analogy of the um, marathon versus sprint which is endurance versus um, one-time thrust and um, the more you can endure the least uh, you, you are in pain and the more precise you are in uh, the tips of the fingers reaching the note they're supposed to reach in the articulation they're supposed to reach in the independence they're supposed to reach if, uh, depending on the layering of the texture and ultimately not to bang when you play loud but play or not to play um, gluey fingers I like to call them four, five or three and uh, equalize the articulation by minimizing the wrist movements for step motion or even for octaves um, for arpeggios I meant, excuse me 